Hi, um, is it Eleonora? Hi, Raquel. Yes, it's me. <laughs> I imagine. If you need anything, just let me know, Eleonora. Sure, thanks. I'm glad to help. Thanks so much. I see some people are starting to come in. Hi, everyone. It's Eleanor from the IGF Secretariat. Thank you for um, joining a little early. If you'd like to use the few minutes ahead of us to test your audio, you can go ahead and do that.
Kyle, thank you again for joining. This is Eleanor from the IGF Secretariat. Um, it's good to see uh, so many people here. Um, we'd hope to start on the hour, but we'll just give it a couple of minutes for um, our chair, Ms. Henriette Eisterheisen, to, to join. She's also the chair of the MAG, and, and we'll be um, uh, starting off the meeting. Thanks very much, Eleonora. I am actually here. Um, I just thought I would do a shangatai and give everyone two more minutes uh, before we um, formally open the meeting. Um, it would be helpful in the meantime if the secret, um, secretariat could bring the agenda on screen for us, please. Um, good afternoon, good morning, um, good evening, um, wherever you are. My name is Anriet Esterhuisen, and I'm the chairperson of the Internet Governance Forum Multi Stakeholder Advisory Group. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today. I'm joining from Johannesburg, South Africa. It's a very bright day. You can probably see bright sunshine and shining um, affecting my, my light. Um, it's really a pleasure to open this session. It's, it's um, part of the IGF 2021, the hybrid IGF's virtual preparatory phase. And the reason that the MAG and the Secretariat has introduced this um, preparatory phase in this session in particular is to enable people who are participating in the IGF in different ways. Some will be face-to-face -face in Poland in December. Some will not be able to be there. They'll participate virtually. Um, but it was to expand the opportunities that we give the IGF community for engaging in the work of the IGF and the issues that the MAG have placed on the agenda. Today's session is also helping us to contribute to a process of IGF strengthening and, and producing the IGF or running and, and implementing the IGF in a more outcome oriented way by bringing together um, the people, the communities of practice and those who support them who do work throughout the year, who are engaging with the issues that matter to them, who produce research, who produce um, reports that outline issues, or in the case of the best practice forums, who are looking for good practice in certain areas. It's to give all of them um, an opportunity to share where they are, what milestones they have achieved, to get feedback um, from other intersessional activities, to feedback from their own constituencies, their own members of their dynamic coalitions, participants in their working groups. And, and in that way to deepen the output um, that will be presented at the December annual forum. So this really is an opportunity to take stock 
to engage the community, the, those that are on the inside of these processes, but also those that are not inside. And so those that are part of, it's also an opportunity for members of one dynamic coalition to reflect on the work of another dynamic coalition. And so I really urge everyone to be present, to listen, you'll have short presentations and to share and to give comment and, and share advice and suggestions and to take us through the proceedings um, today. I'm very um, honored to be handing the, the mic and the floor over to Mr. Marcus Kumer, who was the executive coordinator um, of the IJ for many years and who also served as the chair of the MAG um, a few years ago. So Marcus, and Marcus has been just a driving force in initiating intersectional activities and also in continuing to play a supportive and, and stewarding role. Marcus, I'm very happy to invite you to the floor to take us through the session. We'll, we'll, we'll then go into Q&A and then you'll hear from me again, but now I'm handing over to Marcus. Well, thank you, Oriette, for this kind introduction. And hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be on the call, and I see there's some many well-known names and well-known faces on the call. Some people have been with the IGF right from the beginning, and feel free to correct me if my reading of where we came from is wrong. But when preparing the session, we thought it might be useful to give a sort of kind of historical overview how we all started with intersessional activities and that brings me back to the very first meeting of the MAG as it was not called MAG in those days it was just called advisory group back in 2006 when we were preparing for the first meeting and there we were discussing how we should set up the whole thing as the terms of reference for the IGF were relatively loose. There was no template we could follow, but there was clearly different expectations. And there was on the one hand, those who really wanted the IGF to be some force that would drive the discussion forward, whereas others were a little bit more hesitant and was a reluctance to have anything set up that assembled, resembled a, a new organization. And that's mainly also governments who were always very careful not to overburden the UN with new structural uh, setups and also fearing of budgetary implications. Whenever you ask the UN to do something more, it will cost money. And there were also those that felt there was no real need for anything else in the field of internet governance. However, uh, especially civil society in those days felt very much the IGF should not just be a, a, a once a year meeting, but it should be the beginning of a process which would have work going on between the meetings. So, there was a kind of uh, deadlock would be maybe going too far, but there was an antagony in the positions. And then at the very first meeting in May 2006, there was a MAG member who said, well, there may be dynamic coalitions emerging of groups of people who want to do the same thing. And that's how dynamic coalitions emerged. And right from the start, there were dynamic coalitions, uh, people who grouped around the theme and who carried on, who decided there would be uh, carrying on work throughout the year, working together. And uh, it has to be said, the dynamic coalitions were uh, very heterogeneous and we uh, always agreed to say that there's no one size fits all for the dynamic coalition as they're dealing with all sorts of different issues. But uh, we all agreed on uh, sort of common basic principles that 
dynamic collision should be multi-stakeholder, they should be bottom up, and also they're very independent from the rest of what happened in the IGF. And I, I just wonder whether we could not uh, maybe at this point ask, we have not set up uh, actually an agenda with which dynamic coalitions would report on what they have been doing or on what their achievements are. But if there is anyone on the call who would like to jump in and give us a sort of a live update of what they have been done in the past and what they have achieved, I think that would be most appropriate at this stage. Are there volunteers of the participants to jump in at this stage, put your hand up. It sounds a bit improvised, but I think uh, we agreed we should keep it lively, but we don't want to force anyone to jump in at this stage. Maybe you can do so later. Marcus, I see that Minda has her hand up. Yes, please, Minda. Hello. Um, I don't know if you can see me or hear me. Um, we can see you and we can hear you. Okay, great. I'm Minda and um, I'm the uh, co-chair of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. Um, and we have been around since 2008. Uh, and we are basically an open network of uh, um, individuals and organizations who are committed to making human rights work for the, um, the internet. Uh, so we have around 400 members, so a little bit over 400 members. And we have a steering committee, which is mostly responsible for the outreach um, activities of the coalition. And um, our main document is the chart of human rights and principles for the internet, which is a um, result of a collaborative process within the, the members of the coalition. And, um, and we actually celebrating its uh, 10th anniversary this year. So it was published in 2011. And um, uh, we kind of uh, translate the existent uh, uh, norms and laws and norms uh, and human rights laws and norms into the um, online context. So it's not about new rights, it's about the existent uh, human rights translated to the internet uh, environment. And uh, so our main document has been the charter and we also have the 10 principles published. And, um, and uh, our work has been the outreach work so to create awareness on uh, the chart and uh, uh, its rights and principles and discuss the issues that emerge from uh, issues related to human rights or the lack of human rights online. Um, and so uh, over the last 10 years, we have been translating the charter. It has uh, 10, 11 languages at the moment and uh, 27 languages has, have been translated, uh, the 10 internet rights and principles. Um, and we have been working, other uh, part of our work has been to be present at uh, um, uh, any kind of uh, um, uh, internet governance related events um, and al also outside the internet governance community. Uh, so, for instance, since 2014, the RPC is also a member of the steering committee. Uh, of uh, on media and information society, so the CDMSI, uh, which is based at the Council of Europe. Um, and we also have been working in tandem with other initiatives that promote human rights online. Um, and also other initiatives have been inspired by the charter. And so for instance, uh, the uh, people who are working on Mark Civil at the time also members of the coalition or uh, the Council of Europe's Guide for Internet uh, users use members of the coalition to draft uh, the document. Um, the Evil's Click Rights campaign, that was a campaign for the MENA region, was also based on the 10 principles. And um, most recently, we had the Cities for Digital Coalition, for instance. 
Um, and uh, lately we have been working with the Digital Constitutionalist Network. And for instance, the law students from universities of Padova and Palermo, together with them are responsible for the latest translation uh, into Italian. So these are just some of the things that we have been doing. We also collaborating with other DCs um, and uh, NIs and youth initiatives. Just recently, we were uh, participating at the Asia Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum. We participated at the European Dialogue for Internet Governance. And uh, this month, we were um, uh, speaking at um, youth policymakers. Uh, we have been working with youth sustainable, uh, sustainability project because um, since 2018, we have been advocating for um, more awareness on ICT and environmental sustainability, for instance, and uh, its importance to achieve the sustainable uh, development goals. And so uh, because of this, we have been also part of the, for instance, the Eurodic International uh, Intercessional Group, uh, which is called Greening Internet Governance. And we have been following the policy network on environment. So uh, this just to summarize a little bit of what we have been doing uh, five minutes for 10 years, thank you. Thank you very much for this. And this is actually a very excellent example of a dynamic coalition that has been active for very early on and achieved quite a lot. And I think uh, the achievements are very significant, but again, it shows uh, also uh, that while the Dynamic Coalition is part of Council of Europe structures, as thanks to their output, it's not officially an IGF output because Dynamic Coalitions are independent, they are bottom up, and they are in many ways self contained. And up to now, there is no process that links their outcome, their output into official. IGF output. This is definitely one of the issues that uh, we will, I think, have to address on the way forward. Uh, and this is also part of the very organic nature of how it all happened. But again, uh, and once again, thanks, Minda, it shows, and you're not the only dynamic coalition that has produced significant output. Uh, we also have the dynamic coalition of accessibility for people with disabilities. That is essentially uh, the guidelines on how to deal with accessibility issues in the IGF process. There have been other dynamic coalitions which have made uh, significant, uh, produced significant work. But I don't want maybe to extend for too much discussion. This is very much history on how they started. And while after, uh, while at the beginning there was a strong resistance on the IGF producing work, ongoing work, there was the feeling after almost sort of 10 years of the IGF, the times was were ripe to take a step further. And uh, in 2014, uh, it was finally uh, agreed that, that we should create uh, new uh, places for intercessional work. The best practice forums were the first uh, ones that came up. Although the IGF had experimented early on with best practice forums and the idea then was to learn also from past mistakes to learn from what could have been done better that never really worked as they were more into a show of uh, a beauty contest of people who presented their work without actually being critical about their work and it was felt uh, in 2014 they would also be in need of secretariat support. It could just not be left to a group presenting their work, but it should have been 
uh, supported by uh, secretariat support that could help them produce a substantive outcome. And uh, in 2014, there were a number of best practice forum uh, set up. And uh, one of the, uh, uh, among the first ones, there was cyber, uh, what is now best practice forum on cybersecurity. In those days, there was one on unsolicited uh, content, spam, and the other one on uh, certs, but then they were merged in uh, the, uh, the BPF on cybersecurity. Uh, who will make a presentation? Sheetal, would that be you on the BPF on cybersecurity? It's, uh, it will Is be that when. Yeah. yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much. You're both most welcome. Wim, okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, if I can uh, share my screen, then I, because I have one slide. I don't know if the, somebody can help to uh, let me share the screen. We can see you, but not your screen. Okay. Well, which one of both is best? <laughs> <laughs> Tricky question. Okay, then I will uh, just post a link to uh, an update um, with uh, almost the same slides uh, in the in the chat after the presentation. So, uh, as Marcus said, one of the best practice forums this year is a best practice forum on cybersecurity. Uh, it is uh, focused on the use of norms to foster trust and security. Uh, it is a project that works in, in one uh, year, started in uh, April, uh, April, May, and tries to come up with a draft report with some findings ahead of the uh, IGF meeting to discuss and present them then with the community during the IGF and publish a final output report. So really a, uh, a nice piece of work uh, by the end of the, of the meeting. Uh, but following also on, on some of the, the points Marcus made, also this best practice forum on cybersecurity is linked to uh, best practice forums that were held in uh, 2018, 2019 and 2020, that each of them focused on norms, but from a particular angle. Uh, for example, in, in 20, the first time, 2018 was a very, um, well, like exploring the concept of norms and uh, in cybersecurity, what are they? Uh, 2019 then, with the uh, information collected in, in 18, uh, focused on uh, intersectional cybersecurity agreements, trying to narrow a little bit more. Uh, to then in 2020, it, uh, the works made another a step further and focused on what lessons could be learned on norms, initiatives, but not within cybersecurity, but in other sectors. So looking outside cybersecurity. So that's a bit of the background. I mentioned, um, I mentioned the, uh, the previous reports because they're also available online. And I think for uh, people and, and stakeholders, uh, interested in norms, it is very it is interesting to uh, interesting to read, and also uh, I think a good starting point uh, for people that are not uh, that aware of norms. So uh, that brings me to the uh, work this year, um, and it seems I should be able to share my screen now. No, it seems it doesn't uh, doesn't work. So anyhow, um, the BPF uh, this uh, year, like I said, continues to focus on uh, on norms, uh, but works with three different work streams. Uh, one work stream tries to map different cybersecurity agreements. That's an exercise that started last year already, and continues this year. It's just to look what is available of types of agreements. Uh, with different uh, stakeholders around the world, tries to, uh, like I said, tries to map them, but also tries uh, to, wants to dive into the uh, the question: what actually are now the drivers? What was the reason why a norm was created? And um, also wants to look in. Well, if you talk to uh, 
people that were involved in, in putting together the norm, in discussing the norm, uh, then um, uh, what do they say about the results? That's a question that the, the BPF is exploring in particular with regard to the uh, UN cyber norms. Uh, so that is work that is, is going on. A second work stream of this uh, year's best practice for uh, best practice uh, form is uh, looking into uh, really cybersecurity events or cybersecurity uh, internet events. So if something happened in the past, uh, what would it have been helpful if there was a cybersecurity norm uh, or have existing norms been helpful? So that is a, a piece of work the PPF is working on at this, uh, this moment. Um, and soon there will be, uh, well, very soon there will be uh, some, uh, some results available. A third workshop, uh, work stream, sorry, is focused on outreach and cooperation with other IGF initiatives because it is important. Uh, and this event is an, uh, is an excellent opportunity for that, that the best practice forum is not working on its own, but tries to um, reach out and include other parts of the IGF in, uh, in their activities. So that brings me to uh, a very important uh, message that tomorrow um, at 6 a.m. UTC, it is for many people uh, very early, there is an update of the best practice forum cybersecurity. So you're all welcome to join just to hear from the different uh, work streams where they are. Uh, so that I will post the link as a, to the presentation also in the in the chat, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Wim. And uh, there's the other best practice forum this year is on gender and digital rights. Uh, will that be you again, Wim, or is that somebody else who gives us an update on that? That will be also me, I will give a very brief introduction. And I see we have uh, two co uh, co-facilitators of the BPF. Uh, I'm Rita and Bruna here. So I'm sure that I will miss some very important points that they will uh, happily to, uh, to add. Uh, similar to the uh, best practice forum on uh, cybersecurity, there have been a number of um, best practice forums focused on gender related topics uh, over the past years uh, that for example gender based violence was uh, was one best practice uh, best practice forum also uh, and I think that was last year a best practice forum focusing on gender uh, in in relation to uh, decision making processes in the uh, in the IGF and internet governance area uh, Again, those reports are available on the website. And I think for many of you, it can be an interesting read or starting point uh, if you're interested in the, uh, in the topic. This year now, uh, the best practice forum on uh, gender, um, it's got a new title and a slightly more focused title. It focused on gender and digital rights and very specifically look at, looked at the point of uh, gender disinformation. Um, why? Because it is a new uh, phenomenon. Uh, we all know um, the phenomenon of disinformation that gains and, and that gets a lot of, uh, of, in, uh, of attention from, uh, from different stakeholders. Uh, the BPF wants to uh, very specifically focus on the uh, uh, topic of uh, gender disinformation, where actually gender-based uh, or gender is being used as a, as a time of, uh, of disinformation or a reason to deal with uh, uh, disinformation. So just like um, uh, I think the, the whole concept of the disinformation, one of the goals uh, for this, uh, this BPF is also to really understand and try to define uh, what actually the, uh, the issue is, uh, understand what are the negative effects uh, on the people that are being attacked or that suffer from uh, gender disinformation, and then start to look into what strategies are there. We had a very, uh, somebody raised a very good point at one of the last uh, BPF, recent BPF calls, 
that maybe it is too early uh, to start looking for best practices uh, to deal with uh, gender disinformation as the phenomenon is uh, relatively new. Uh, to talk, you can start to look on, on what works, what doesn't work uh, in terms of experiences, but it might be too, uh, too early to really define best practices. So it's better to uh, focus on showcasing positive initiatives that make results. So that is more or less the overview of uh, the work this year. Uh, that is, you will receive or you will find that also reflected in a draft report that will be published ahead of IGF and then discussed during the IGF meeting. Uh, this best practice form on uh, gender and digital rights also has a call this week. Uh, on the 14th, so also to, uh, tomorrow. Uh, and yeah, similar, I will. I saw that the co-coordinators -coordina already posted the links in the chat, uh, but if they and Rita or Bruna, if you have anything to add, please. Thanks, Wim. Um, and hello, everybody. This is Bruna here. Um, just to add one short thing that is, um, we're also aiming to focus or even highlight some like cases or examples of gender disinformation to the whole discussion. So for now, we're still considering addressing three ways in which this phenomenon happens that is regarding um, journalists, human rights defenders, and also politicians. So maybe if any of you has any like good or relevant cases in your countries or regions that would be worth highlighting in the report or the work that the BPF Gender and Digital Rights is doing, um, it will be very much welcome. So yeah, that was just that. Thank you, Wim. Well, thank you both on that. And I would like to pick up on one point you made, Wim, on saying, uh, is there enough uh, basic experience on calling something a good practice or a best practice? And that was, essentially the starting point for having best practice forums. They should not develop policy in whatever way, but should collect what good practices are around. And uh, also when we tried to uh, revitalizing the intersessional work streams in 2014, there was also the feeling that there may be a, another uh, format better suited for looking at policies. And back in 2014, there was connecting and enabling the next billion as a sort of policy work stream. And that is now what we have, the policy network. So we have a policy network on environment, a policy network on meaningful access. Uh, that has a slightly different function, but it's also essentially in, in driving policy work between the sessions, but with a slightly different uh, starting point. And I know all the different work streams, it may sound confusing and back again to zooming into the dynamic coalitions, what you heard from Minda, uh, they are autonomous, they are bottom up, whereas uh, the best practice forums and the policy networks, they are installed uh, and authorized by the MAG. They have a, a different uh, sort of policy umbrella, shall we say, than the dynamic coalitions. But with that, can we turn to the policy network on the environment, which is in its first year this year, and obviously, uh, in the world of climate change, this is a very topical issue. And I presume Florina will brief us on that. So is it anyone else? Florina, I believe you were muted. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, okay, sorry, I just, it seems to, I might, could we start with Raquel and I might have to drop in and out of the Zoom account. I think um, there is a bug in there. I apologize. Maybe no, Raquel. No worries, we have to be flexible. Okay, then we go to the policy network on meaningful access. Raquel, that'll be your turn. 
Thank you very much, Marcos. And I apologize, Lorena was not trying to interrupt, but just to bring to your attention the muted button, which is our, the burden of our time. Um, but uh, I also would like to call uh, Silvia Cadena, um, the co-chair from, sorry, I see I have the video now. Um, Silvia Cadena is the co-chair uh, for the, the PNMA, the multi-stakeholder working group. Um, so Silvia, if you want to start with a few words or should I go? Thank you, Raquel. Ahead? Yeah. Thank you, Raquel. Uh, really appreciate um, the opportunity. Um, I am very honored to be uh, participating in, in this uh, session and introduce the Policy Network on Meaningful Access, which is also on its first um, a edition, let's say, as a policy network. Um, the policy networks are a new type of intersectional activity um, that um, have a, a working group that um, um, drives uh, some of those um, conversations in line, of course, with um, the agenda, the UN Secretary General Roadmap for Digital Cooperation and the agenda around um, the global connectivity, digital inclusion and um, capacity building. And um, it, it started very recently in June of this um, year. And I am putting on the chat the link to the new um, policy uh, network on page on the new website uh, for you to have a look about the scope of purpose, um, the members of the working group um, in the list to the mailing list and the little um, information that we uh, have available there. Um, so far, we have had um, four uh, very interesting calls with the members of the working group, um, and we are in the process of, of finding our feet, let's say, to identify what is the state of the art, what is the discussions that are outside happening around meaningful access, and what are efforts that other organizations and groups have um, em embarked uh, so that the policy network highlights those, builds on those, and do not duplicate the work that they are already doing. So in the space of the, of the IGF, uh, it is very common to write reports and look at how um, you know, sets of recommendations and analysis of information that is coming the members of the working group are pretty much determined not to just do uh, a list of recommendations, but to work on something that helps move the needle uh, in, for policy implementation. We are yet to discover what that is. <laughs> so at that space, I guess, uh, but it's, a, it's been a very interesting uh, set of calls and conversations around um, trying to connect the dots between what the policy network can achieve um, based on the great work that other organizations have done. So, so far we have done two um, kind of high level analyses on the, the round table 1A of the digital cooperation is working on a very interesting uh, uh, tool to put together uh, indicators that reflect uh, what meaningful access is based on data that is collected at the moment and is uh, available for the, from the ITU and other sources. And they have been working on this uh, tool to be able to uh, help people uh, identify what meaningful access is, the state of that in their own uh, economies. So we discuss what they do, what the scope of their work are, and then how we see the work of the, of the uh, policy network fitting into that. And then in the last call, we went through the, the UNESCO um, a framework for univers universality indicators, the Rome X um, indicators, in, which is a, a really comprehensive uh, tool um, that can guide a lot of the process and understanding about how you build um, evidence-based uh, policy, which I guess is where we would like the things to to move around. Um, the, the page that I put on the chat has the scope of purpose and a bunch of other information that I guess is not that relevant to repeat here. Um, but if um, 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 
uh, Raquel has any other uh, comments to make, I will only want to uh, say that we are co-chairing it with Sonia Jorge from the Affordable um, Alliance for Affordable Internet Access and myself, the Internet Foundation. And then we have four fantastic uh, liaisons uh, working with uh, in the MAG. So trying to uh, bring part of the conversations from the MAC and the IGF and the sessions that are happening at the IGF and the intersessional work at the IGF inside a policy network. And hopefully in that uh, melting pot, something interesting will come up and we welcome uh, input, comments and participation from the community as all the intersessional uh, groups do. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to um, present uh, this very briefly. And um, lovely to see you, Marcus. I uh, haven't seen you in a while. Um, and same for you, Raquel. And, and over to you, Raquel, if there's anything you want to add. Likewise, thank you very much, Celia. It's nice hearing from you. I was just reminded by the secretary, should really make sure we leave enough time for discussion. So, uh, with that, I think then I would invite uh, Florina. Are you operational now for the policy? Yes. yes. Okay, please. <laughs> I Florina. believe I am. Great. Thank you so much. So I'll see whether I can uh, share this. It seems to be working. I've also um, posted the link to this um, slide share um, slideshow now in the chat. So feel free to check that out. I think it's always nice to have some visuals, especially when there's lots of uh, talking as well. So let me just try to quickly go through that. It's not a lot. So I really just want to give everyone a bit of an overview of what we are doing within the PE. So basically, um, as Marcus has kindly um, explained, the PE is, is a policy network. So we're the sister network, so to say, to the um, network on equal access. And we are focusing on the nexus of environment and digitalization. And the idea really of, or the main um, output that we're focusing on this year for this year's IGF is the report. So we are formulating, or we are in the process of drafting a report where we are um, sketching out uh, policy recommendations on how to achieve global action in this intersection between the environment and digitalization to achieve the environment and development goals. The PNE has other related goals that are not or that we are also focusing on this year, but since the PNE has just launched this year, this is really our main focus at the moment. So here just for you to give you an idea, here is an overview of um, what the table of content looks like for our report. I've also put in the link to our draft report, so you're very welcome to take a look at it. It's completely open to comment for anyone. And so if you are also interested in these topics, um, but maybe haven't been following the PE's work closely or haven't had the time or resources, feel free to leave your comments there. Um, we have basically um, in the first month of the PE kind of try to work out what our scope is and what the structure uh, is going to be. And we are now working within thematic uh, work streams. We have uh, kind of def defined a couple of thematic areas that we are focusing on. So environmental data, food and water security, supply chain, and overarching issues. And we have a work stream for each of those. Um, on our website, this is the old <laughs> screenshot from the old website. Um, I'm, maybe some of you are aware that the IGF has a new nice website. So uh, go on, on there and uh, you can have a look on where when you click on policy network or intersessional activities, then you can see the different work streams that we have and all of the information on the policy network on that web page and that I um, have linked here as well in the end of this presentation, you can also find uh, information on upcoming and past meetings. So you can always stay up to date and uh, maybe just so uh, a couple of just a word on the PE meeting. So it's happening once a month and uh, we usually have guest speakers and updates from the work streams. And very importantly, our next uh, work stream meeting is happening on November 17th. And we have decided that that's when we also want to hold an official kind of open consultation. So we really are planning to do a bigger outreach for that PE meeting to really invite all kinds of stakeholders to comment on the first full draft report of our uh, PE report. So that's our 
big uh, kind of midway deadline before the IGF um, in December, which hopefully many of you are attending or all of you are attending in some way or form. And I'm really looking forward to yeah, interacting with you to hearing all of your thoughts on, on what we have compiled so far. So please check out the report and get back to me or um, reach out to us if you would like to get involved. That's my main message, I guess. Thank you very much for this, Florina. And with this, I think we heard a very had a very rich menu and heard a lot about substantive work going on intersessionally. And with that, I hand over to you, Henriette, to chair the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Marcus. And thank you to everyone who has contributed. Um, are there any questions um, at this point? Uh, I'm looking in the chat if there are any questions. I, I do have a general question, and I think I'll, I'll just ask her to get us going. And Marcus, this is to you, but it's also to, to the Secretariat and the, the DC coordinators, the, the BPF MAG members and support people. Do you feel that this body of intersessional work is, is taking us um, closer to, to this call that we've heard from the UN Secretary General for a more impactful focus IGF um, in the roadmap for digital cooperation. There were various recommendations on strengthening the IGF. Um, more recently in the common agenda, um, the document issued by the Secretary General, um, there's reference to the need for the IGF to be innovative, to support the, the growing um, internet governance ecosystem. So yes, I do you feel that the sum of the parts, the many parts that make up the, the IGF intersessional words is, work is taking us towards that? Um, what more can we do to, to, to really share the, the depth of this work more widely than we are at the moment? Well, if you allow a spontaneous reaction to that, as I think the work that is being done is quite substantial. And uh, I feel it's more a question of connecting the dots and making them, bringing them together and also bringing it up to the attention of policymakers. I mean, what we heard from all the various speakers, it is quite impressive. And uh, the very first speaker on the DC on rights and principles, uh, you know, that's clearly a series of work that had impact. We also had other DCs that are not on the call today, but I do remember there was DC on net neutrality. They had an impact also with the Council of Europe, but it was not necessarily seen as IGF output. And here, I think uh, there is definitely a, a case of bringing it all together under one umbrella and making it clear that this is actually work done under the umbrella of the IGF. There's the other stream of intersessional work we haven't talked about today, that's the NRIs. They also have an impact, the national and regional IGFs. They have an impact at the national and the regional level. But again, they're not necessarily seen as IGF output as such, but they are part of the IGF environment, the IGF network, the IGF ecosystem. But uh, here, again, it's a question, how do you bring it all together and making it sure also to the outside world that this is actually something that is happening already. And quite often it has emerged from the IGF. It was not installed top down. The NRIs, they started fairly spontaneously, was the, feel, the felt need that something needs to be done at the national and regional level. And they do have an impact there, the same way the Dynamic Coalition was like-minded people who got together and did something, but it was in a very spontaneous bottom-up way. And I think uh, what we have to do, and it was definitely 
innovative in its approach, but what we have to do is make sure that we connect the dots and we bring it to the attention of the outside world. This is actually an IGF output. That's my take on this, thanks. Thanks very much for that, Marcus. And I actually think that this session is, is uh, an effort to, to, to help connect the dots. And what else? I see Sylvia Cadena has also posted about connecting the dots. Um, and I'm still looking for hands. Sylvia, please take the floor. Any suggestions from you um, on, on how we can do this connecting of the dots and, and make this output of the IGF more visible, particularly um, among policymakers, but also at a high level within the UN system? Thank you, Andreat. I, I you know, would like to um, emphasize that when people are working, you know, and I'm, I'm speaking on my engagement from at the IGF since more or less its beginning. Um, when you are working in, you know, a, a regulatory environment in a particular country and you're trying to figure out, you know, what change could bring experiences that are coming from other, uh, you know, geographic locations might inspire. Uh, my warn you, my alert you about the positive positives and the negatives of what can happen. So even you know, for some of the, the, the folks that have been involved like me in the IGF for many years, that mapping exercise may seem like old news, but uh, in reality, that actually helps to understand how this is an iterative process. So it seems that we are, may not be solving the problem, but in reality, we are just understanding it uh, better. And when you are uh, diving, uh, looking at your own work only, finding the time to actually connect the dots by yourself is very, is almost impossible and, and very time consuming and uh, language barriers, etc. So the efforts of these groups of the VPFs, the the NRIs, the digital, the, the dynamic coalitions, the, the policy networks now to um, filter, synthesize, and produce something that uh, helps you understand the collective efforts out there, I think is pretty uh, remarkable. Uh, and I, I would like to emphasize also the point that Marcus made around recognizing that that thinking about connecting the dots mapping, um, bringing different voices, it is actually a product of the IGF in all of this process. And, you know, all of us that have participated in that bring some of that home in, into our work and, and we need to recognize how that benefits others in, in our own work. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks. Um, thanks, Sylvia. I think um, what you both you and Marcus are saying is that we need to connect the dots but we also need to recognize the value that's between the dots. And, and that's not always easy to make visible, um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have impact. And any other questions or, or comments on the specific um, work processes we've heard? Um, any suggestions for how we can, can continue to strengthen this intercessional work? The floor is open. We have a few minutes left. Judith, please go ahead. Oh no, is that Mark Carvel? Sorry, it's Mark. Please Mark, go ahead and just introduce yourself. Thank you, Henriette. Uh, my name is Mark Carvel. I'm based in the UK. I, I worked um, uh, for the UK government from the very start of the IGF um, back into the early history described by uh, Marcus. Uh, I'm now an independent consultant. I'm a member of EURIDIG, European Regional IGF, and I, I work with a dynamic coalition, the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Standards, Security and Safety. I put a note in the chat earlier on about, uh, about that with a link. And my comment, um, uh, as I just put in the chat really, uh, about the, 
about the future and joining up, connecting the dots, which is a very good way of expressing it. I think there are challenges. We've got to do a lot more as a community um, uh, to ensure that there is much more communication and understanding of how different intersessional initiatives actually can um, mutually support each other uh, and also avoid the risk of duplication and also ensure that there are no gaps in what, what the IGF is responding to um, as important urgent issues. There's a great emphasis in what uh, the UN Secretary General is saying about the IGF responding to issues, urgent, urgent issues and also being alert to emerging issues and intercessional activity can do a lot more, a lot to, to help achieve that, I think. And, uh, and my other point was the communication um, and that it should be year round. You know, what we are all doing intercessionally um, uh, should be communicated throughout the year and there should be events and so on to provide platforms for that. The national and regional IGFs do provide those platforms, and and you know, in our coalition, we've had the great um, opportunity to present also at Eurodig and and recently at the APR IGF, and and we want to do a lot more, you know, to to showcase what we're doing, to get more members uh, to join us, because we are, as I said in the chat, we are we're a new coalition on internet standards. And, and we're still building up the membership. We need to, to promote awareness. So, and, and so people know what we're doing, why we're doing it, what we're gonna produce. And also then how we communicate what we produce in terms of outcomes to policymakers in governments, uh, in regional organizations, and also decision takers in business and the private sector. You know, we, we, we you know, that's a key objective for us is to is to provide outcomes that people are going to pick up you know and there's not enough work done to measure impact and also to deliver we we've in our coalition coalition we've talked about appointing liaisons and things like that we haven't got a firm idea so there's a lot more we can do thank you thanks very much mark um eileen we have a few minutes left eileen and then florina let's hear from you Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I will try to be very brief. Uh, so, for example, to add to Mark's comments uh, on activities, uh, well, I can mention some things that we have been doing, like, for example, for the youth like IGF, we had, uh, well, last year and also this year, we have representatives of uh, DCs. So, for example, uh, this year it was uh, Savio Moraes who was talking about uh, the DC on Internet of Things and the things that they are doing. So that was very enriching for us. Um, so, for example, um, as I was saying, on some activities that we have been doing, uh, we have been collaborating with Internet Society on the Youth Ambassadors Program uh, for the mentorship part, I mean. Uh, so um, that's other way that we can contribute uh, by bringing more young people into the IGF and um, teach them how to participate in the intersectional work uh, so uh, we can have more youth perspective on the different topics. And um, well, as, uh, as a last mention, because I know we are running out of time, is uh, our collaboration with uh, Yondesa and the Mayor Group for Children and Youth on the design of a policy brief related to digital cooperation and how young people can contribute uh, to a new social contract. And, um, and yes, I think that's, that's all on my side. Uh, Thanks, Eileen. Thank you. Those are, those are good concrete examples. Florina, you'll be the last speaker. Okay, well, I actually just have a small comment or something I've been thinking about is that we might also um, do good to maybe um, put this on our agenda that we don't only think about uh, knowledge transfer in ter terms of uh, content, but also maybe in terms of methodology, because as a newcomer to the IGF and as a kind of consultant to a new format to the, to the IGF, the policy network, I've been really aware or made aware that obviously there's so much knowledge on 
um, like com knowledge, compiled knowledge from all of these formats that have been existing with the IGF uh, for many years. And they have so much knowledge on uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration that we might also uh, think about that in the future, how we can really make sure to not lose any knowledge on that and how we can profit from the experiences of each other and to make sure that we don't kind of stick to key persons as it sometimes happens within these uh, type of organizations that when a key person leaves then the knowledge is also gone but that there is maybe some way to make sure that we don't lose that knowledge and that we can really transfer it to to newcomers to who want to be engaged in the IGF. Thanks, thanks, Florina. And I think that's actually maybe also one of the things we'll learn from the Dynamic Coalition Learning Study. So everyone, I'm just going to highlight a few things in the chat because I think they're important and I hope they'll find their way into the, the outcome of this session. Keep in mind also that that these preparatory phase sessions, that we are documenting some of the key takeaways, and these will feed into the Katowice Forum. So everything that's said today is not going to be lost. So I think very important points about connecting the dots, um, but also about the value of these dynamic coalitions and best practice forums and, and, and the other intersessional modalities in their own spaces, um, but that it can be impactful to, to link them to one another. Um, there was a very articulate here point from, from Mark saying that two key challenges is to um, increase the linkages um, of the various intersessional modalities, global, regional, multi-stakeholder, and then better delivery of all IGF outcomes. And that includes um, outcomes from BPFs, DCs, and policy networks to decision takers in governmental and private sectors throughout the year, not only after the annual um, event. I think Mark also emphasized the year round process. Um, and then Jennifer's important point about collaborating between the DCs and NRIs. And I think that is happening organically, but it's also happening through efforts from the Secretariat um, and, and can, can be strengthened, but, I, but it's really good that there are already um, efforts around that. So um, I want to close the meeting. I want to give Marcus just the chance to make some closing reflections. Um, and Marcus, if there are any specific actions that you'd like to um, recommend to the MAG and the Secretariat, um, please go ahead. You are muted, Marcus. Sorry about that. Yes, sorry. Uh, no, I said you summed it up nicely, I think, and all the comments received went into the same direction. So, I mean, we are on the right way, but we obviously need to work closer together and make sure also the various components interact and that we pull in the same direction. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, uh, I repeat what I said before, and I noticed it was picked up by some. It's not in re in about inventing the wheels, but about connecting the dots and making the outcomes more visible and bringing to attention also throughout the year to the attention of policymakers. Thanks. That was an excellent. Thanks very question. much. Thanks for that, Marcus. I think I would add only one thought to that as well, and that is to galvanize this, this distributed knowledge and action and practice network that, that makes up the IGF ecosystem to respond to some of those key challenges that Mark was referring to. At the moment, the agenda is very bottom up, but I think we could also use this network to take on the challenge to explore certain issues which are identified as, as, as global priority issues. So I think that what this represents, this intersessional network and infrastructure is really a, a, a collaborative um, source of knowledge and action, which is really, which reflects what the IGF stands for. So thanks very much, everyone. Thanks to the Secretariat for organizing this and for Marcus to be with us. And to all of you who presented and those of you who did not present, but who are doing the work, um, it all really makes a difference. So thank you very much. And we'll see you at the next preparatory phase session.
Thanks and goodbye. Bye, everyone. See you soon, hopefully. Bye, everyone. Good night. Bye, all. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.